An idea we encounter in many different deep learning contexts is that we can often train a neural network with one data set that's easy to get or easy to use, and then take some hidden layer from that network and use it as a way of encoding data that can subsequently be applied to other problems or data sets. When we do transfer learning with residual networks, we can think of the pre-training as learning some sort of useful image processing that can then be applied to a different data set of images. And when we throw away the output layers of the pre-trained model and add different output layers for a new task, it's kind of like we have a new network that is processing the encoded data that the pre-trained model produces. Likewise, with word embeddings, producing this sort of data encoding is explicitly the purpose of the learning. And this comes up in all sorts of other contexts as well. The deep learning model that takes this idea to its extreme is the autoencoder. An autoencoder is a network that is trained on a completely unsupervised data set because the data that we give as input to the network is also the data that the network is trained to output. This means we don't need any labels and we're solving a regression problem that would be utterly trivial to solve with linear regression. But mapping a data set to itself isn't actually the point here. The goal is that if we make the hidden layers progressively smaller, we will force the network to learn some representation that shows up in its hidden layers that is more compact than the input that we gave. And if the network is able to reproduce the original input consistently from that smaller representation, this network is learning to perform data compression. Supposing, for example, that we had a 200 by 200 pixel image as the input and the output, then we have 20,000 dimensional data points. But if we could bring that down to a smallest hidden layer of, say, a thousand neurons, and if the network is able to, from those thousand hidden neurons in the middle, expand back out and reproduce a very good approximation of the input image, then we could think of the first half of this network as performing 20 to 1 compression, and the back half of the network as performing decompression. But this idea of using a neural network to perform data compression isn't actually all that useful. There are way better non-learning-based algorithms for compressing various sorts of data. So where we can actually make use of this sort of autoencoder is if either the first half of the network is useful in producing a representation that we give as input for some other deep learning problem, or if the second half of the network is useful for producing examples of data from the input set. The idea of using the first half of an autoencoder for transfer learning was popular in the early days of deep learning, but now we have way better approaches to transfer learning. But the idea of using the second half of the network as a decoder that produces examples from a data set is the starting point for many other deep learning algorithms. The simplest of these is if we have achieved the maximal possible compression by making this hidden layer as small as we possibly could, then it ought to be the case that just about any reasonable vector that we could give as input here will produce something that looks like data from the data set if we run it through the decoder half of the network. 
So if we wanted to generate random samples of data that looks like the distribution of our input data, we could generate a random vector and then feed it through the decoder in order to produce a random example of the type of data that the network was trained on. Unfortunately, that only works if we really have achieved the maximum possible compression here. And it's really hard in general to be sure that you've done that. What's much more likely is that you'll either find this hidden layer is much too small and no matter how much you train it, it can't get very good at reproducing the inputs. Or this is too big and there are some possible input vectors that we could give to the decoder that don't actually resemble anything from the data set. To build some intuition for this, think about the oversimplified case where this smallest hidden layer is just two neurons, where we can then plot the values of those two neurons. And if the black points are all of the values that we got for these two neurons when we passed the data through after training, if we were to randomly generate a Z1, Z2 vector, we could end up somewhere over here that's not anywhere near the data from the data set. So when we pass this through the decoder, the output is probably just going to look like random garbage. So if we want the decoder that we train to be useful for randomly sampling from a data set, we can change the architecture slightly to encourage the autoencoder to learn representations that look like the sorts of things we would get if we sampled random vectors. And that leads us to the variational autoencoder. The idea of a variational autoencoder is very similar to the regular autoencoder, except that we replace this middle hidden vector that is the encoding of the data with two vectors that serve as a mean and a variance. Then we likewise train the autoencoder by giving it an input and the same input is the target. So we are encouraging the network to produce a compressed representation in the encoder and then decompress that representation in the decoder. But the representation gets combined in a particular way. We have a random vector r that gets generated by sampling each element from a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one. Then that gets combined with the two vectors that are the hidden encoding of the data. The random vector gets multiplied with our variance vector, and then that gets added to the mean vector and that produces the vector that goes as input into the decoder portion of the network. When we train this network, the decoder portion has loss that comes from how close it got to reproducing the input, and that decoder loss also passes back and influences the weights in the encoder. But the loss for the encoder network also has a second component that gets added to the decoder loss, and that is a divergence between the mean and variance that it is learning and a normal 0-1 distribution. So this loss is trying to ensure that the encoder doesn't stray very far from outputting a mean of 0 and a variance of 1 on each dimension, which means that we will get representations that are clustered around the center of the space of possible representations. And so later, if we randomly sample, we are unlikely to get things that are far away from the learned distribution. So once we have trained the autoencoder, if we want to generate samples that look like the distribution of our data, we can generate random z vectors, sampling them from a normal distribution on each dimension. 
and give those to the decoder. And because of the fact that we used this divergence loss, and also a regularization that I haven't shown here, we can be reasonably confident that any vector we sample in this way is reasonably close to the sorts of representations the encoder was producing. And so when we pass this through the decoder, it will produce an output that is very likely to resemble the sorts of data in the training set. So what all this does is takes the idea of using a neural network's hidden layer as a data encoding and turns that into an encoding that we can sample from, which means it's possible to use a neural network to learn a probability distribution over a data set. And this gives us the starting point for generative adversarial networks that we can use to generate all kinds of interesting data.